Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're bringing you an extraordinary program on the life and contribution of Christiana Morgan to the development of C.G. Jung and the field of analytical psychology and beyond that to bring this remarkable woman's contributions the respect that it deserves. In about 1926, at the age of 28, Christiana traveled to Zurich for nine months of intense personal analysis with C.G. Jung. Jung found the images that she had drawn, based on her active imaginations, as a female journey parallel to his own experiences that he detailed in the Red Book. He saw this as an extraordinary demonstration of individuation which is the incarnation of the full self. He saw Christiana as a remarkable person, called her his pioneer woman, and clearly she was a significant muse for him. Now, her analysis and the images that she shared provided Jung with the materials for some of his most important studies which have now been published as the Vision Seminars that he delivered between 1930 and 1934. Jung was able to show the humanization of archetypal images in analysis. Now, that may sound particularly abstract, but it's something that we've spoken about in the podcast on and off. That the archetypal level of the psyche, which is where these powerful universal forces influence all of us, lean into our personal psychology and guide us, nudge us in directions. But in order for that to happen, they need to transform from these overwhelming forces into personalized, humanized images that we can relate to. Christiana's visions helped Jung, perhaps even showed Jung, step by step how that remarkable process occurs. It also helped him understand something about the typology work that he had developed early in his career, particularly around the idea of the fourth or inferior psychological function which is the part of our psychological traits that remain partially submerged in the unconscious, which become a kind of gateway into the deeper part of the psyche. Christiana's life work became exploring and understanding the feminine unconscious of her own visions, and beyond that, sharing that information, to express this through sculpture and paintings, and relevant to today, the creation of her Tower on the Marsh. After Christiana returned from Zurich, and despite her lack of very formal education, she was brilliant. She became a lay analyst and the co-director at the Harvard Psychological Clinic, where she helped found the American field of psychotherapy and psychology. While she was at Harvard, she co-authored with Henry Murray the Thematic Apperception, Apperception Test, or the TAT, which is still used today widely. And very frustratingly, 
as has been the case for too many female pioneers, Christiana's name was removed from the EAT, the Thematic Apperception Test, and other Harvard publications that she significantly contributed to, despite the universal agreement of her rightful authorship. And today, rather appallingly, the thematic apperception tests and other things published at Harvard still list Henry Murray as the sole author. Part of her legacy that's fallen into the shadows was her creation of her own Tower on the Marsh, which was inspired by Jung's Tower at Bollingen. Christiana built her tower as a symbolic representation of her own individuation journey. It was a psychological expression of her love affair with Henry Murray. Inside, it was filled with carvings and stained glass and remarkable artifacts, so that as Christiana abided in the tower, she was surrounded by the artifacts of her own individuation process. After an intense and radical surgery for blood pressure, after years of rather excessive drinking, Christiana died at the age of 69 in the Virgin Islands. She was found deceased on a beach in just two feet of water, mysteriously having slipped out of the hands of the people who loved her. Today, we have the extraordinary privilege of talking with Hilary Morgan, who is a filmmaker and the granddaughter of Christiana Morgan. After decades of working internationally as a documentary cinematographer, Hilary returned to making her own films and recently completed The Tower, a film about the spiritual retreat that her grandmother built. Hilary is currently working with a group to save the tower which has fallen into disrepair. She's hoping to create a full-length documentary about the depth and breadth of her grandmother's work. Hilary lives with her family on the south coast of San Francisco, and she is here today to bring Christiana Morgan back to life and bring the magnitude and depth of her work, the respect it deserves. So thank you, Hillary, for making time with us. It's, it's just remarkable to, to just begin to understand just how profound Christiana's contributions were. So we'll have a wide-ranging conversation, undoubtedly, but we will show your documentary today, so perhaps you can start by helping us understand why you made the documentary, and perhaps what it means to you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I began this film um, knowing years ago when I went to film school that one day I would make a film about my grandmother. Um, she died when I was 12, and even though I spent summers living next to her, um, I continued to hear lots of family stories over the years. So when I became a documentary filmmaker, I knew that one day I would make a film. Um, so I began to collect interviews with family members, um, find family photo albums, um, and begin to put those together. Um, and then, um, you know, little by little after graduate work, I became a cinematographer and was busy working, doing that field for a number of years, and so put off the documentary. But I, but I knew it was coming. Um, and then through the years, I would go back and visit the tower, say every seven, eight years, um, and just visit it 
and uh, visit who was living there, which the school that owns it now has used it for teacher housing. Mm -hmm. Um, But around 2016, 2017, I noticed that the tower was really in need of some work. Um, And I was also uh, introduced to, uh, met two New York uh, Jungian psychoanalysts who had also visited the tower. And they were also quite concerned about the state of the tower. Uh, The tower now is going on almost 100 years old. Um, So they decided to put on an all-day symposium in New York um, in order to raise funds for the tower. Uh, What we were specifically looking at was the stained glass windows, Mm. which at that time we were noticing were beginning to crack and to bolt. And so there was a lot... A uh, great deal of concern in saving them. So wonderfully, uh, through this all-day symposium, we were able to raise funds to save and restore the the stained glass windows. Um, but I knew, in order for this symposium, it would be really wonderful to make the film. Um, so uh, the date was set for February 2019 to do this all-day symposium in New York. And around, I would say, November 2018, I found myself procrastinating. Um, The time was getting closer and closer, and I still wasn't getting to work on it. So uh, one night, I uh, woke up from a dream and uh, walked over to the bookshelf in my room and pulled a book off the shelf that was one of my grandmother's old books and um, opened it randomly to a page. And the first line that caught my eye was the first line in the film, which is across the broad continent of a woman's life falls the shadow of a sword. And I knew at that moment um, that I had the film. Um, This was a quote from Virginia Woolf. Mm. So I closed the book, put it back on the shelf, went back to bed and woke up the next morning and was able to begin the film. Hillary, do you remember the dream that you had that night? Per chance. You know, I don't. I'm sure I have it written down somewhere yeah. because uh, I do keep track of my, my uh, dreams. But yeah, okay. I, I love that it led me it led me to that book. It led me to that quote. Mm-hmm. It it started the process. And I was able to make the film, I was able to write the script in a week and a half's time. I, wow. it just poured out of me. As I said, it just had been brewing for so many years and just uh, it just really poured out of me. Um, it took a bit longer to pull all the images and the music and, and to edit the whole thing. Um, but fortunately, it was done in time for the symposium. Can you evoke a little bit about what it was like for you as a girl to be in the tower before we uh, view it? Well, you know, um, it always was just a very, very mysterious place. Um, my grandmother was extremely mysterious and aloof. You know, she was not the warm, maternal, cuddly grandmother. Um, But we would go over and visit. She had this beautiful stone pond um, with uh, Kuan Ying sculpture, which you'll see in the film, in the in the yard, in the garden. And we would come over and and swim in it all the time. Um, But we also were not allowed to just come flying, even though we had a little rustic cabin nearby. She had started um, early on, she built a little cabin for my father, uh, which when my father married and had children, he added on to. But it was a very rustic cabin. It was single wall, no insulation, a shower outside. You know, very much like her tower, it, she had no electricity. The fireplace was how, how uh, you know, warmth was generated. Um, and so we would go over there, but if uh, the gate was closed or if there was a black car, that meant Harry was visiting and we were not to come over. Um, and other times as well, uh, we were always to ring this little bell that she had on the gate in order to gain admission. Um, and I also, you know, I have these memories of going to visit her and she would put us to work shucking peas. Mm-hmm. Um, she would pay us a dollar a pee, um, and also, uh, polishing the brass on a beautiful wooden, uh, chest that she had that had, um, brass on the, the edging. 
Um, the, she had carved the, the top of the chest. It was quite beautiful. But she would put us to work polishing the chest. So, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was an interesting relationship with her. Um, but, I, but I also have lots of fond memories. I don't know if we want to go into it now or after the film, but I, I do have a number of lovely memories about her. But but it sounds like the tower was was a kind of part of your girlhood. So it has a really personal significance to you, in addition to being this incredibly important kind of cultural landmark, really. I wanted to ask also yeah. just about the documentary before we watch it. Um, so so it's a short documentary that was made sort of as an offering for this all day symposium in twenty nineteen. Do you have plans to make a larger, like a full-length documentary, or what's where is that, Hillary? Before we... I, I do. I, I'm actually okay. right now working on a longer documentary about her. This right. Tower film was very much sort of an outline as an overview of her life and her work, mm -hmm. and now I'm really looking into exploring and going into further depth about her work and life. Um, so that's a work in progress at this point. Well, maybe this is a, a good time to transition so we can enjoy the documentary together. For those who are watching with us, this will last about 26 minutes. It's beautiful and fascinating. In 1926, my grandmother, Christiana Morgan, traveled to Zurich, Switzerland to be psychoanalyzed by Carl Jung. It would be a turning point in her life. She was 29 years old. During the nine months that she worked with Carl Jung, she created three volumes of her dreams and visions. These became the basis for Carl Jung's four-year-long seminars called the Vision Seminars. Until that time, they were his most intensive study of a patient. It is from this body of work that he was able to develop many of his theories about the use of the imagination in psychoanalysis and most importantly about the psychology of women, then an emerging field of study. This is the story of her life's work and mysterious death. In 1927, my grandmother and grandfather William found a piece of property on the edge of a tidal river near Newburyport, Massachusetts. Christiana from her diaries described buying what they called the property. A great rock set in the jungle of scrub birches, broken down pine limbs, encroaching sumacs and blackberry vines. She knew when she first saw the place what a struggle it would be to bring order out of such chaos. There, they built a rustic one-room cabin, which had no running water or electricity. The cabin had a large walk-in-size fireplace to cook on. In 1937, after my grandfather died, she sought to make the place a retreat where she could continue her work on her visions and research from the Harvard Psychological Clinic. Having started a love affair with Henry Murray, the place also became a sanctuary for their relationship. Later, after Harry came back from visiting Carl Jung at Bollingen, Switzerland, they were inspired to add a stone tower to the cabin. She and Harry got together and drew up sketches. They sketched it out and then they sat down with my father and said, what can you do to give us this? 
And then he explained what he could do, building the walls, how to build the walls. He had to blow out the, the ledge he had to put it in. So I, I would think that they all together came up with this place. And there was never an architect involved. Christiana sought a builder in Newburyport and was told about Kenneth Knight, who came from a long line of Newburyport carpenters. So he started at a young age doing this, and I'm sure he learned a lot from his father. The thing I remember most is building the tower. 80 years ago this year, must have been 1937. I think I was six years old. I might be a little bit off on that. But when it started was when they set off the dynamite and blew the, blew the base out. And it didn't hurt the building. You know, that was one big thing they were afraid of. But, but they were able to, you know, take it out. And, and this thing's never settled, has it? It's on solid ledge. And I remember standing out in the driveway, and they, they had put the dynamite, they drilled it, put the dynamite in, and then they blew the rock away. And I remember sitting out here seeing rocks flying through the air. Originally, until a road was built, all of the building materials were carried in by wheelbarrow. Mr. Knight was a master carpenter and mason, working tirelessly to plane all the wood material by hand without any power tools. He didn't have any power tools at all. All hand saws, everything was hand saws. And he used an ads a lot. Uh, well, he had a miter box. Today they have these chop boxes that do a nice job of making angles. And he had one of the old hand boxes and all that he worked with, again, hand tools. And he was a master. It always came out perfect. He would never, ever compromise his work. He always said that if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. It evolved too, I suppose, you know. They learned from each other. And as they went along, they came up with different things. From her diary, she wrote, when I was around night, while he was building, I always felt the simple goodness of the work, the physical labor of a maker, which I experienced here for the first time, clearing the ground, cutting down trees, pulling brush for the burning, tearing out the stumps, hauling wood, digging the earth. This was the toil that took all my bodily strength. And I learned the rich reward of inner peace and bodily serenity when strength returned at evening and I walked out to see the new shape of the things which my labor had brought about. He, he didn't talk very much, very quiet person. He didn't teach her how to carve. He told her how to use the tools to carve. She was the artist. Excerpt from her diary. Knowing that I really cared and was carving with wood, he would instruct me as to why a tool must be used this way and not that, how it should be sharpened. And he would tell me stories of his grandfather's experiences, the old ways with wood, the virtues and limitations of the old-fashioned tools. It took only a year and a half for Mr. Knight to build a three-story stone tower in additions to the cabin of a kitchen, sunroom, and woodshed. These buildings stood above the river and came to be referred to as the Tower on the Marsh.
Christiana, like Carl Jung, held an acute ability to mine her unconscious through the use of the act of imagination, and then to resurface to coherently describe and record her images. These visions guided her on an uncharted feminine journey through her primitive unconscious to the realm of her deepest emotions and inner world. Over time, as the visions became more prolific, powerful, and detailed, Jung encouraged her to put them in a journal. For Jung, her visions were archetypal amplifications of the unconscious elements of her personality. Jung felt that through her journals, a deep, unconscious, archetypal, primitive, feminine self was emerging. Christiana filled three large leather-bound volumes with elaborate paintings and pen and ink descriptions of her visions. Carl Jung, over four and a half years, would give hundreds of seminars based on these journals. They would become known as the Vision Seminars. The 20 volumes that comprise the Vision Seminars represent the most extensive presentation of a patient's case material by Jung. Both towers were spiritual and artistic refuges for my grandmother and Carl Jung. Jung carved the stone and painted the walls in Bollingen. Christiana painted and carved on wood and designed stained glass windows in the tower. After the completion of the tower, Christiana spent more time making it a sanctuary for herself and her art. Along with creating a life filled with elaborate rituals, she created an environment throughout the tower and garden, adorned with carvings, icons, and sculptures, rich with her visions and she and Harry Murray's private symbols. The tower contained three large round rooms that were connected by a winding staircase. Her study was on the top floor with a semicircle of windows that overlooked the tidal river. Set into the wall beneath these windows, Kenneth Knight built her a large mahogany desk. He also constructed tall bookshelves to house many of her books. Here she would work for hours, recording her trances, writing her book, and creating articles of research for the Harvard Psychological Clinic. Next to the bookshelves was a small wrought iron ladder that led to the rooftop where she could sit and look upon the marsh and watch the river meander towards the sea. The bottom room was half underground as it had been tucked into the contour of the land. As her meditation room, she would trance and perform rituals. This is also where the Gaston Lachaise sculpture of her lived when it was brought in from the garden for the winter months. 
In 1966, she replaced the two large windows in the meditation room with stained glass that were inspired from images in her visions. The two windows were created like two religious triptych panels. She commissioned Mary Creighton, a notable stained glass artist of cathedrals, to carry out the work. Between the two rooms, in the middle of the tower, lay her bedroom. In this room were two sets of French windows that opened to the gardens and the river below. In the middle of the room was a large wooden bed with a sculpted headboard and overhead an intricately carved piece of mahogany. Behind the bed was a hidden closet with a carving on the door. The living room, which was originally the one-room cabin, had large wooden bookcases that Kenneth Knight put in after adding the tower, sunroom, kitchen, and outer sheds. The sunroom off the kitchen contains perhaps the greatest number of her art pieces. Here she adorned the room with carvings, paintings on wood, and elaborate symbology. With time, she began to expand her detailed focus on the building and decorating of the tower to the tending of the surrounding landscape. Having worked side by side with her father in his garden while growing up, she learned a deep love and appreciation for the beauty and wonders of nature. From his garden in Maine, she transplanted sweet-smelling irises, roses, coral bells, lilacs, and peonies, all reminding her of her childhood summers. Over 40 years spent together as lovers and professional colleagues, Christiana and Harry sought to go beyond Jung's idea of individuation and the reconciliation of opposites. 
they sought to evolve and create a supreme example of a romantic love. What they referred to as their synergy entailed harnessing their intellectual, creative, and erotic energies to form a divine myth, a new arcane religion, what they called the highest philosophy. Their joint venture was meant to be defined and symbolized by the creation of the tower and their book. Here, in iron and wood throughout the tower, one can see the symbol of their union. The dyad, as they called it, was comprised of a series of complex rituals where they explored the darker side of the unconscious, sought to reconcile opposing sides of the self, the masculine and feminine, the yin and the yang, and to create a more whole and balanced union. Her visions were the inspiration and the underlying foundation for most of their work together. While Christiana was a psychoanalyst, researcher, and helped run the Harvard Psychological Clinic, she is best known for co-authoring the thematic apperception test. The TAT is used as a projection test in clinical psychology. Pictures were presented to patients in hopes of eliciting responses that could allow the analyst to understand the patient's underlying personality hidden in the unconscious. From her diaries, she wrote, A strange oppression has been on me the last two days. It seems to be overwhelming and sad and awe-inspiring. It is different from pure depression. It is as though it were the breaking of the last shell of consciousness. It is like gazing at something full in the face. The fact that to my child, to my husband, and to Harry, I must be mother and nothing will ever stand between me and the forces which are around me, that I will be eternally alone, looking at these naked things, always unprotected, and then measuring them to the capacity of these several individuals, veiling them and transforming these things that I see to meet the needs of each one while I see them in the raw. I have the feeling that this may be the real awakening consciousness of a woman. It makes me feel appallingly alone. In 1967, while vacationing with Harry, she died in the waters off St. John's Island in the Caribbean. This time, she descended into the depths, but never came back. She sought through psychoanalysis to study her unconscious in hopes of leading a more individual life, free from men's projections and the restrictive societal conventions that were placed on women in those days. Being ahead of her time, she rejected the role of being a mother and a wife and instead became an intellectual, artist, and psychoanalyst. She discovered a woman's voice and a new woman's psychology through her visions and her work and sought to unite the inner opposites of feminine and masculine to create a more comprehensive and unique feminine identity. From her diary, she wrote, the first of her treasures, she thought, was having made this journey into the depth. She had found a unity in herself. My grandmother returned again and again to her visions and believed they were the core myths of her life. I believe that the tower was physically inspired by Carl Jung, but spiritually by Alfred North Whitehead, whom my grandmother affectionately called Alti. Alfred North Whitehead and his relationship with his wife Evelyn were hugely influential to my grandmother. Christiana felt that the union that Whitehead had with his wife was ultimately what she and Harry sought. From her handwritten letter, she writes, it was in 1939, when the lilacs were in bloom, that I brought Evelyn and Alti Whitehead to see the tower. 
Here I quote from my diary. Alti at lunch was discussing the intellectual mind, the virtue of mysticism, to open the eyes to wonder, the recognition of value, value which can't be said, such as this tower, this place. Later he said, I have found out something about you. You are a truly creative and great person. Everything that you have made here tells me that. It is more than individuality and uniqueness. It is greatly creative. This place is more than you. It must go on. Letter to her son, my father. You see, the tower isn't just a house. It represents a way of life. Harry's in my life for 40 years. Quite aside from the money, all our symbols are there. It has been for both of us as if we were writing a book. It is there for anyone who has the eyes to see or to comprehend. Now, if you were writing a book, which took you 40 years, wouldn't you like to know that it was going out into the wider world? It may take many years for this house to be understood, but anyway, the carvings, the symbols, the stained glass windows are there. And I doubt very much if anyone will root them out, because the house now has what is called mana. Soul. It's such a an important thing you've brought alive here, Hillary. Thank you. Would would you maybe just uh, kind of bring us up to date on what's happened to the tower since? Well, um, having been used as teacher housing for so many years, um, it is in need of restoration work, various things like new roofs. Um, we'd like to restore the gardens and, and much of the building the way it was when my grandmother lived there. Yeah. So um, it was, it was just, just, just to track in, in case uh, some people didn't catch it. So it was passed when, when your grandmother died, it was passed to your father. And then subsequently it was given kind of in trust to a school. And the idea was they were to uh, I, I don't know, sort of use it as a museum or a teaching resource or something like that. But, but instead, they've sort of commandeered it for housing. Is that is that right? Um, well, it was it was hard to understand for my family because when my grandmother died, she willed it to my father and mother, and then said after they died, they were to give it to the school. Um, and I found a letter not too long ago with uh, that she wrote to my father explaining why she did that, which was because she had, uh, they had a family home um, up in York, York, Maine, that she and her sisters uh, had after her parents died. And her two sisters outvoted her with um, selling the house. And it, it really broke her heart. And she mm -hmm. saw how quickly something so loved by a family member could, could leave the family. So, um, she thought it best to give it to the school. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, 
you know, I think in large part because she did die and um, Harry was busy with his new life. He went on to marry um, two years later after she died. Um, and he was still quite busy with his work. Um, that the tower just allowed to be used the way the school felt it was important. Um, you know, I think um, they thought that it was best to put a school teacher in there. Uh, they they lacked housing, but also for security pur- purposes for people not to break into it. So, um, so it was used as housing uh, for teachers and. Um, you know, as people who don't rent and don't necessarily own places, it doesn't necessarily keep up to the standards one's what one would like. Um, and Listen, I'm sure kind of keeping up the the tower would would require some resources, and and perhaps the school hasn't even had those resources to sort of maintain it the way right. it should be maintained. Yeah, right, right. And that's that's one of our hopes is after we raise these funds to restore it, to then have an endowment so that mm-hmm. this never, ever happens again, that it'll forever be taken care of and protected and be able to be shared with the wider world. I'm thinking about how uh, the narration, your nor- narration in the film is uh, about, wouldn't you, as she wrote to her son, wouldn't you like your work to go out into the wider world? And that the life she lived and all the work she did on the tower, it's poignant and uh, sad uh, that something that could go out into the wider world um, at this point is not. Yeah, and I think that's part of my mission, actually. I mean, Mm -hmm. not only do I find her an incredibly inspiring woman and have been very moved by how other people have been very inspired by her work. Um, but I feel as if that was what she was centering her life around was her visions and the work she continued at Harvard and what they were trying to do at the tower. And that that was sacrificed in many ways, uh, you know, that the rest of the family sacrificed because of that work. And that's an added need of why it needs to go on. I mean, not only is that, I think, a very important contribution, um, but I think also. Um, you know, that's, that's where her passion and, and interest was, was to, to spread her work. Mm. I'm intrigued by her notion of uh, the dyad, uh, that she and Harry were lovers for 40 years and tried to continue Jung's work of individuation and extend it into an interpersonal relationship and maybe a human embodiment of what the union of opposites could look like. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you say more about what you think and understand about uh, her passion for that? Well, I think I'm still um, trying to figure all of it out. I've been working my way through uh, thousands of pages of her journals, her writings. They were writing a book about it. Um, and just recently I found more under Harry's archives at Harvard. There are four different archives of Christiana's papers at, at the Harvard archives, including her vision journals. Um, so there's a lot to sort through. Um, so I don't fully understand it, but I think that they were, you know, continuing the individuation process that she began with her vision journals. Uh, with her work with Carl Jung, and that she was taking that individuation process further as just herself into the relationship with her and Harry. Um, And the two of them were doing the work together. Um, They they believed, you know, between the two wars, between World War I and World War II, there was just this incredible... um, change in in disillusionment you know that people had lost such faith in so much that politics religion you know it was the time mm-hmm. Nietzsche's god is dead um and so i think they were she was very idealistic person and i think they were searching to create this this myth and this new religion um right so right which i i really felt that hillary during the film 
when you spent all that time lovingly focusing on the stained glass. Mm. It really, mm. really hit me, you know, that, that she was really trying to live out uh, this, uh, she was really trying to live out the symbolic life. She was really committed to that. And, and she wanted to um, sort of actualize it to the fullest extent possible. I mean, interestingly, I, I, f I find, you know, having, having uh, you know, read her, her biography, uh, you know, in preparation for this, by the way, uh, her biography is uh, Translate This Darkness, written by Claire Douglas, a Jungian analyst, and we'll put that in the show notes too. But, you know, it's because one of the things, you know, on the one hand, she was so unconventional and she was trying to live out this symbolic life. And on the other hand, she was told by Jung and others that her role was to be the femme inspiratrice, to be kind of an adjunct to the man, you know, or the soror mystica. Um, so, so somehow um, those two things feel to me uh, like there's a tension there, that, that, that she could make a commitment to living out the symbolic life, and yet somehow it necessitated him. You know, it necessitated Harry Murray. I don't know if others would agree with me that there's a tension there, but I think I, that was rattling around my head as I was reading, and I'm, I think I'm still trying to to work that out because it 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 feels like um, on the one hand she was very committed to her own bringing forth what was in her, and and on the other hand it feels like she was often doing so in service to him or or another man like Jung. Yeah, I think um, so much of the readings that I've been done, her personal readings, have been shifting my perspective a little bit because um, I think that when she came, when she was working with Jung, he was incredibly inspired by what she was creating. And he was very, very supportive of her work. Um, and then when she came back from Munich, having at that point um, consummated her relationship with Harry um, and returned to Jung. Um, this was during her analysis. For some reason, the analysis began to change. Um, some people have surmised, some Jungians have surmised that perhaps all of these incredibly powerful female archetypes that were coming up were more than Jung could kind of deal with. Um, there was talk in Claire's book of Jung being jealous of this new relationship that Harry and Christiana were beginning. There was, um, she even intimated that Jung may have had an affair with her at one point, right? Right, which I have speculation. Sort of, it's speculation. I have a hard time with it because she was just falling in love with Harry yeah. Murray at that point. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I find it a little str strange that especially a woman just in that new phase of a newfound, you know, that infatuation phase and being so uh, deeply um, distracted would also, but one is not to know until we get more of the papers between Young and Christiana, I think. Um, but I think that um, as the therapy continued with Jung, and it was towards the end, Jung began to become less supportive and more disparaging of her and more. Um, and he also began to say to her, uh, you know, maybe it's time to have another child. And what I really think now is that you should get behind in creating Harry, that his success is going to, you know, be dependent. Um, and also very much supportive of a triangle. He had the triangle with Tony Wolf, and he had the triangle with his wife, Emma. And so when both Harry and Christiana came to him at different times, conflicted about this new, you know, growing affair between the three of them, he, of course, was very supportive of it. Um, so I, I think that um, I feel as if Christiana was not subordinate to Jung. I don't think she was subordinate to Harry. Um, and the men in her life. I think she was very supportive of the men in her life. Um, and Claire really makes a lot of her um, argument in the book is about 
how Christiana was subordinate to the men. And, and I think that when you look at it at this point, it, it appears that way because Christiana's name is on none of the work at Harvard. No one knows about the tower. No one knows about her artwork. She, she seems like this figure, the veiled woman in the inner circle of Carl Jung's world, which is the subtitle of her book as well. Um, there's, you know, in the correspondence with Jung, Christiana does push back. Jung will, says to her, you know, you're scolding me and you're right to be scolding me. Um, you know, they made up years later, but I think she was very somewhat defiant with his, you know, with his change of heart towards her. Um, I think she, I imagine she felt pretty hurt, you know, that would be. Yeah. And, and I think the strongest point I want to make here is that I think that um, Christiana had, from what, my understanding with the readings I've done, Christiana and Harry had this agreement that she was to help him with the Harvard Psychological Clinic. She helped him co-direct it. She helped as a researcher. Um, she had patients. Um, and they published um, three different publications together. And um, the most notable being the TAT. Um, and he, the, his part of the bargain was to help her with a tower and to continue their individuation process as a couple at the tower. Um, and so, you know, this, this, this was what the agreement was. And in the end, tragically, Harry could not really come through with his part of the bargain. He was a very gregarious, charismatic fellow, but he was um, very drawn to his work at Harvard and the very sort of active social life he had, both with his family and professionally. And it was really hard for him to give that up and devote as much time as was needed to Christiana and the Tower. And I think that's what made the relationship um, uh, fall away and, you know, it became very sad for her. I'm curious a little bit about your sense of Christiana's experience in herself of her collaborations. Because I think it's easy to sit here in 2024 and fantasize a certain kind of political frame on the outcomes of her life. And, and from this perspective, imagine, well, if I were in that situation, you know, I'd feel outraged or I'd feel these different qualities. But I wonder if you have a sense of what it was like for her to collaborate with um, her lover, but also with Jung relative to the seminars. Did she experience herself being exploited? Um, you know, I haven't gotten through her analysis notes. These are, these are some of the real treasures that still exist that are at Harvard. She, she took extensive notes after her therapy and her reactions to that. Um, but from her other journals and things that I've wrote, that I've, that I've written, um, I, th I think there was some real frustration with her because she really was beginning to tap into these, in, the animus figures and these incredibly powerful uh, archetypes that were giving her new strength and new independence. And, you know, quite frankly, what she what she suffered from as a young child was depressions, which were largely brought on because she was being repressed, that the, the society was so repressive towards women um, not being able to use, you know, go off to college and use their minds and, and join the workforce. And she was very much a precocious, very intelligent, strong-willed child who actually was put in a closet by her, by her mother, who, who found it really at times very hard to, to deal with this child. Um, and um, when she became really depressed as a teenager, um, at that time, the doctors would prescribe bed rest. They would recommend taking books away and not socializing, you know, taking, taking away stimulation, which was the worst thing for her possible. You know, she really wanted to get out and experience the world and read great books, uh, you know, learn more ideas and, and really just open her horizons and to work. I mean, she, you know, 
escape to New York from her parents' home uh, to, during the war um, to become to, to learn be, become a nurse. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th- I think I think there's you know there's a lot there. I just want to sort of make a quick announcement. Um, if you're in the audience and you're watching and you have questions. Um, just go ahead and type them in. We will be uh, sprinkling those in. So uh, feed us your questions. What I'm aware of, though, is how hard she had to fight uh, to be herself uh, from not conforming with the cultural expectations of what a young lady ought to be. Um, and, and then the interaction with Jung and what was, I think, projected onto her. And then later with, with Harry, who, who couldn't meet her either, even in their agreed-upon uh, personal work together with the tower and visions and symbols. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering if, if some of this was the toll that having so much projected onto her took uh, s- some of the depression that she had in later life as well. Well, I think very much so. I, but I think that in the beginning of both of her work with both men, it was very supportive and it was very dynamic and collaborative. And there was a lot coming out of it. But I think with time, it grew and change. And I think Harry became more involved with his ego and what he wanted out of it. Um, and so I, th- I think with time it changed, but I think, you know, there were some amazing years and, and lots of testimony from their colleagues at Harvard about, you know, what an amazing environment it was and how Christiana helped bring it as a gender neutral, a very egalitarian environment, a really dynamic, exciting environment to work in. Um, so um, I think, I think there was a lot. And I think the early years of the tower that the tower has just, you know, remarkable work that came out of her with her paintings and sculptures and drawings, as I said. What I think I'm hearing, which I think is so important, is that Christiana would not want to be seen as a victim. Absolutely. And I think that's really important. That, yes, she had struggles, undoubtedly, that were cultural. Relationships are very complicated. But I think she would have wanted to be seen as somebody who was potent, creative, dynamic. And that she was initiating remarkable things that she benefited from. And, yes, there were disappointments as there are in life. But you're bringing forward the remarkable accomplishments that she, in fact, did have. Yeah, and what I knew of her and the family stories I heard about her, I, I think I'm, I'm piecing this all together. And we'll, we'll include some of that in the film as well. Um, and, yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, one also, I think, has to stand back to a certain extent um, and look at the lens in which one is looking through this story, which is part of what brought me to uh, look into Claire Douglas, you know, this woman who spent 10 to 11 years of her life researching Christiana and what it was about her that made her so fascinated by Christiana, um, which is really an interesting side story because she um, was J.D. Salinger's wife. Oh, um, oh, I didn't know that. Experienced wow. a lot of firsthand abuse um, by J.D. Salinger. She was that was a tortured uh, marriage. Yes, yeah, so a lot of emotional abuse. She and her daughter were um, not allowed to see friends. They were kept in the house and not allowed to go to town. So, um, you know, she finally escaped um, and became a, a union psychoanalyst. But it, you know, and and then there's also my own. Um, and, and sort of contemporary, you know, view that I bring to it that of, of her being a woman, but she, I think the remarkable story thing, one of the more remarkable things about this story is that she is a woman who came out of the early part of the 20th century in the 1900s and 1910s, um, from an old Boston family that was very repressive, 
Um, there was a lot of um, puritanical and religious um, convention and restrictions, and she broke free of that. And, um, you know, she was really taken with Jung's idea of the libido, which was a force that energized both creativity and sexuality. And she became, um, you know, very sensual and sexual. Um, and I don't believe ever had any interest in marrying, uh, certainly not be becoming a mother. But, you know, she, she really did throw off a lot of the restrictions that she grew up with um, and led a really interesting, you know, free-thinking, progressive, eccentric, and bohemian life. Which is exactly what Jung said individuation is, that to cast off the ways that we have been colonized mm. by family, religion, culture, expectations, mm -hmm. and that still goes on today. Mm -hmm. so that what we are colonized with that is alien to our nature whether or not we think that it's a appealing or unappealing, that the, the project remains alive and still, and still the same in many ways for men and women. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking about uh, from, from what you guys were just uh, speaking of is the way that different people have projected things on her, right? In her, mm -hmm. in her life. I think when my imagination, and this is me projecting onto it, I suppose, is that when she went to see Jung, Jung kind of saw her as the counterpart to Tony Wolf, and of course, you know, Harry was the counterpart to Jung, and uh, and and he was in his own complex at that time, perhaps, and sort of that led him to see something in their relationship, and and you know, and he kind of steered them in that direction, um, and then uh, now that's really I didn't know that about Claire Douglas. Perhaps Claire was projecting some of her own experience. Perhaps mm -hmm. when I read about it i'm reading i'm projecting my own experience into it and so it's almost like you know even in life a lot of people projected stuff on her and that's continuing to happen now it's almost like her her whole life is a kind of ongoing projective test that maybe maybe tells us more about us than than really about her but certainly uh she's a very very complex uh person so here's a question from the audience, uh, someone says, I would love to hear more about Hillary's lovely and fond memories of her grandmother that she mentioned before the film screening. Oh, so I would too. Okay. So. All right. Well, um, I think one of the favorite activities that I would do with my grandmother was um, she would come over and get me and we would get in her old sedan. Um, and the summertime, um, and we would roll down the windows and we'd drive out onto these beautiful roads that, that went through the marsh. Um, and um, after driving for a few minutes, we would stop the car and we would let her dog out, who was a long-haired, medium-sized, mixed-breed dog. Um, and then uh, my grandmother would uh, light up a cigarette and we would proceed to roll, drive along at about 10 or 15 miles and um, through these beautiful um, marsh fields. And um, we would be running the dog or walking the dog, her, her way of walking the dog. And she would proceed to tell me stories. And, um, you know, we would have this wonderful, lovely time together. So that, that is one of my, my fondest memories of, of her. Yeah, you know, I'm going back to pick up the thread um, that that I'm following prior to uh, the listener's question, which is, you know, what we see, what we project onto Christiana Morgan's life, and the symbol of the veil and the veiled woman and a veiled life uh, that she. Uh, has has come to more light through Claire Douglas's biography, um, but there is she hasn't had the notoriety, uh, the recognition, the public acclamation that that many another person would have had after having done all the professional work at Harvard and. Uh, having co-authored the thematic apperception test, 
having built the tower and all of her works of art that are in the tower. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that symbol uh, and, and the statue of, uh, she has been veiled. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, because I think we're hearing more and more about how women's work years ago were usurped and uh, men put their names on things. And there's a, there's a lot coming out about that. And I read just recently that um, at Harvard, well, you know, in the 40s after the war, um, men who had been in the armed forces were coming back to reclaim their jobs in the workforce which, of course, so many of them were occupied by women. Um, and so at Harvard, um, there was uh, a new influx of psychologists uh, that came to work with Christiana and Harry, and many of them held these same sort of beliefs that there was a certain feeling of feeling threatened by women. And around that time, Christiana began to sort of take a back seat to things. Um, but it's also the time that her name was taken off the papers. Um, so um, Harry, I think Harry gives a story that he didn't feel that she was really up to um, having to reply to a lot of the uh, responses that might come in about the work, even though she continued to do the research and the revisions on the thematic apperceptions tests. Um, she, you know, still stayed very active on the work. Um, but, you know, this, this comes back to a theory that I have about it, too, of her being supportive but not subordinate, in that I, I really don't think, you know, my grandmother's real center was with the tower and her art and the reworking of her visions and the continuation of her individuation into this relationship with Harry. And it wasn't the Harvard it wasn't she wasn't, it wasn't ambitious in that way yeah and it, it wasn't ego she she was not the ego and and she and harry were sort of lovely in you know, compliment that way she, her being the introvert him the extrovert and did you know harry was did did you what what did you what was it like when they were together what what did you did you ever see them together or i didn't see them a lot together i think they were they were usually pretty private in their mm -hmm. times my relatives did they would spend time with them mm -hmm. But um, I, I just had, you know, brief, um, all the family parties were over there and I would see them occasionally then. But the other thing about it, which has been really interesting as a documentary filmmaker is, um, and for my next film, is even though it was an affair that people at the clinic knew about, um, they still very much tried to keep it secret because it was the late 20s, the early 40s, the 40s, and, and very unacceptable to society. So um, I have two photographs, is all, of the two of them together, and I'm still searching for more. And that's how good they were. A lot of the photographs in my film, my father snuck off. And I think the one of them in the canoe is one that my father, you know, snuck of them. But they did a pretty good job of, of keeping it secret. Uh, to people outside their circle. Hillary, do you know much about the rituals that she was experimenting with? I find that really fascinating. Yeah. It's really fascinating. And I'd love to share some journals that she kept of them. Um, I don't think I, at this point, know a lot of the details, but she has pages of journals that she uh, did beautiful artwork of. And they would describe what the piece of music was that they played. And um, they, they would dress up and they would put on, um, they would read various pieces of poetry or literature to each other. Um, they would make a particular alcoholic drink. Um, there was, there's a great deal that they did um, in their rituals that way that some of them were recorded. Um, and, you know, the, the ritual life was really interesting. It continued not only throughout the tower but into the tower, uh, into the tower landscape. Um, she did a lot of gardening. Um, she, like her grandfather, um, like her father, I mean, was really, really, um, really loved to garden. Um, and she and Harry um, did a lot to name 
parts of the garden. They had um, bowling and circle, uh, Omega's cradle, they named a part of the garden. Um, Guardian, Guardian Hill was another name. Uh, Garte's brow, um, just these, these beautiful sections of the garden that they created. And then various trees and shrubs uh, that they put in, they would give names to. And then she created also more journals documenting each year what plants were put in, uh, what part of the tower had been changed or added onto, and very significant um, events that had happened in her life. And, you know, the TAT happening or maybe her parents passing or things like that. And they're all illustrated in, in a really beautiful fashion. You have the sense um, of how she held the spirit of her journals. Because for someone to be so committed to journaling and recording, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm caught with how she was fantasizing um, the journal was receiving it. Who did she think might one day read it? Who was she writing to all of these years? Well, I think, you know, I don't know. I think some of it was incorporated into her work at Harvard. Um, some of the very early TAT images were from her visions, and, and they were, um, and there's one, there's a really cute little one in, of a little boy with a violin that's actually my father. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, I think some of it she incorporated into her work at Harvard, the research that was being done. But in a way, she took um, her inner life so seriously. Um, in the mm -hmm. part recording, it was part of that very serious respect for her own psychological reality. Right. Oh, which is, which so. is so. So speaking of which, I, I just get great. There's a ton of great questions coming in. And, and is there anywhere, this is a, a question, is there a place to read her diaries or any writings about her relationship to her creations? So, Hillary, do you, do you know? Yeah. If, uh, um, yes, it's uh, to my knowledge, it's all accessible at the Harvard Archives. Okay. And as I said, there are four different libraries. Um, Schlesinger being also right next door at Radcliffe, also. But you can make an appointment and um, gain access. You know, make an appointment to see um, these various archives and journals and letters. There are photographs there. There's there's a great deal of stuff. So great. that's one way. Yeah. I'm I'm uh, thinking about the tower and her journaling and rituals as the equivalent for her of Jung's Red Book. Yes, and um, so one of the groups there are, there are two groups now that have been formed in order to further the legacy of Christiana's work. Um, one of them is I'd mentioned before the Tower Group. Um, and uh, the other group is a scholarship group, which is a wonderful new group made up of uh, Jungian scholars and psychologists who are trying to restore uh, the legacy of Christiana's work. And one of the first things um, they're hoping to do is to uh, publish her vision journals, mm. um, very much the way that the Philemon Foundation did Jung's Red Books. It would be amazing. Um, so that the, the public could see them. Um, and then the other thing, I'm sorry, the other thing is that um, they're hoping to restore her name. They're hoping to do many things, but another project in the works is to restore her name to the Harvard papers, um, the, the three publications. Again, related to that, someone asks, um, how can we help Hillary's project of her film of documentation of her amazing grandmother's work. So if someone's watching this and wants to get involved in some way, how can they support you? How can they support the work of bringing this amazing legacy forward? Well, um, I'm glad you asked because um, <laughs> the, anyone that isn't in, in, uh, interested um, in financial sponsorship or inquiries about the project, we have a web page set up on my website, uh, which is towerofdreamsdoc.com and then slash support. Um, and you can go there and let us know what, 
what your interests are. Um, we're, as I said, looking for sponsorship and volunteers and expertise and any ideas of ways that people feel like they could help with this. Yeah. I have a question, Hillary, if I may. That, um, you know, Jung heard Christiana's stories. He meditated on her images and he was changed by them. It did something to him, a kind of alchemy. So I'm curious what it's done to you, poring over these images, digging into these visionary experiences. Has it activated things in you and have moved your journey forward? Yeah, it has a lot. I mean, I feel really, really inspired by her work. And being one who has always been fascinated by dreams, as I said in the beginning, and also been a very, very prolific dreamer, um, I feel very moved now to begin to study my dreams um, and, and to, to, to find out more about what my dreams are trying to tell me. So I'm very much um, beginning that work right now. And so that's very, so, very moving that, that she was, took this so seriously. She took her inner life so seriously. And, and when, did, when, did you, when did dreams start mattering to you? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I think they've mattered. I think so. It's not, I, is Hillary frozen? Yes, I think so. I think we've lost the connection for the time okay. being. Okay. Um, we're going to let our producer try to reach out to Hillary and see if we can bring that back up. But, but while we're waiting for Hillary to join us again, um, someone asked a really great question. Um, hello, uh, hello, Rachel, um, about the archetype of the tower. Mm. And maybe, uh, you know, I was thinking about that because Deb and I, we visited both Bollingen and Marie Louise von Franz's tower. And uh, here's another tower. So uh, maybe we could just talk. First of all, I want my own tower for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to visit. I'd love to visit Christiana's tower. Um, but but what uh, what about the archetype of the tower? Well, Joseph, I'm thinking. You know, you are a resident uh, tarot expert. And mm -hmm. that there is a tarot card, the tower, that could start us off. The lightning struck tower, which is the 16th mm -hmm. major arcana card in tarot. In that regard, the tower is, in that tradition, is thought to be uh, the personality. That each brick mm. that's laid in the tower is a sensory experience a life experience, mm. and that by the time the tower is finished, and there's a male and female figure inside that represents the conscious and the unconscious mind, it seems that something has been formed, but also it, it has a limiting dynamic. When we look at that from a psychological standpoint, mm. the first building block of the personality is discovering the not I. The child mm -hmm. bangs their hand against the crib and, ouch, and I'm over here mm -hmm. and something is over there. So the foundation of the tower of the personality for most of us is an experience of being separate. And that's rightly mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Many of the analytical theorists talk about this separation of the ego from the self and that that's an important differentiating mm -hmm process. So we need these towers of isolation in a certain sense. In the lightning struck tower, there is a force that comes often from the upright quadrant of the tower that strikes the tower, blowing its top off and casting the conscious and personal subconscious mind out into this free fall. And so it represents these experiences that come into us often from the archetypal realm, that our personality is not what we thought it was. Mm. The world is more than we could have imagined, and that we are cast out from the sense of limit and separation into a world that is much more dynamic, 
that we are in a fluidic relationship to life, not mm. siloed in these towers of isolation. Now, that said, mm. I think Christiana had a very different experience of her tower, although yeah. I have to say, if it, it did seem to represent her personality, mm -hmm. that she was building something that was all her own, mm. that, that as part of her self-definition, her image. It's like a test, like did Jung say that test, did he call it a testament in stone or something, Bollingen? Yeah. You know, it was a, it was, it's like a, a physical representation of, of, um, you know, it, in a way I want to say it's kind of a physical representation of ego, but ego in, 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 in harmony with the self or something. Exactly. Right? Uh, the ego uh, self <laughs> access allows the ego to receive these remarkable guidance. I, I was going to say that it's um, a rendition of soul, of uh, uh, the, the true place of where one's ego, one's I, resides. Uh, in, in a dwelling, I mean, Jung uh, conceived of his tower, added to it, built a lot of it, um, you know, not as an architectural enterprise, but as something emanating from within. And I can imagine uh, Christiana Morgan in her tower. It's actually a very feminine symbol, all those Freudian associations aside, mm -hmm. every, everybody forget those. But uh, the, what a wonderful enclosure. Can you imagine being enclosed in this roundness with different levels, access to the roof, French doors that open on the marsh, and all your own work? I would imagine it would be such a place of haven and home. Well, it's, it's interesting um, because, I, because yeah. I think, like, one of the things about the Red Book, right, is that... Um, you know, and I think Steve Martin, actually, who was one of the analysts who helped bring the Red Book to publication, he talked about this. I thought it was such a good point. Is it, it's really, it's really such a um, physical representation of the commitment to the inner life. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Right? And it's like we yes. kind of all need our own Red mm -hmm. Book. And and Christiana took that really literally, and she mm -hmm. actually, you know, and and Jung said, "Go put this in a book, and that will be your cathedral." And because that's where your soul is, you know, and, and she did that. She created that book. And then if you think about it, the, the tower, whether it's Bollingen or Christiana's tower or Marie-Louise von Franz's tower, mm -hmm. um, we should talk a little bit about that, Deb, you and I. Um, but, but in any case, uh, it, you know, it, it's again, it's that physical representation of that commitment to the inner life and kind of surrounding it with symbols that your own psyche gave you, whether it was in a dream or an act of imagination. I mean, the inside of Bollingen upstairs has this beautiful mural of um, Philemon, who is this uh, old man with the horns of a bull and the mm. wings of a kingfisher, uh, who first appeared to Jung in a dream and then Jung engaged in active imaginations with him. So you're, you're, we, when Deb and I visited Bollingen, we were not allowed to go upstairs and see that, but we did see many yeah. of the, you know, the carvings and everything that were around. And, uh, you know, Marie Louise von Franz's tower had, you know, th again, images from her dreams and visions and, and, a, and, a, and a little room set aside just for active imagination. So. Mm. I remember your description of the room that set aside and I was struck that it was a bare room, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. That it was kind of a blank slate. And mm -hmm. and what I was fantasizing, I don't know it to be true, is that uh, Marie did not want to be influenced, that she wanted it to be a space where her psyche could manifest itself without having to contextualize it with anything that had been there previously. Yeah. You know, where, um, where I somehow am going with this is you know, that Bollingen is now um, in possession of Jung's descendants. Mm. And um, Marie-Louise von Franz's tower was uh, being occupied yeah. 
Uh, so there was still, and we were so hospitably received um, by him and by the Jung family at Bowling End. And I am uh, really feeling affected by the fact that Christiana Morgan's tower has been untended mm-hmm. and and uncared for. And it, it is, to me, the most magical, the most lyrical, the most entrancing, soulful, of these three towers that we've mm. that we've discussed, mm. I'd give almost anything to be able to spend time in that tower. Uh, so I, there's a sadness in me that yep. that this incredible, incredible work of inner and outer effort uh, is is not being lovingly, reverently tended. Absolutely. And this is where the listeners and later as we distribute this on the podcast, where people really can be moved to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, To first assess, uh, you know, the state of the foundation and the walls, uh, you know, sort of an engineering project uh, to see what the bones of it, uh, what their state is, and uh, and then move on from there. You know, I'm I'm wondering. Um, we're we're trying to get Hillary back, and uh, so far, no luck. But our producer is working on it. But uh, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming in, and many of them are for Hillary, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, but some of them I can answer. So someone wanted to know, was she married to Harry? And she was not. She was married to William Morgan. Um, And so it was a really painful kind of love triangle. I I got the feeling that it it was sort of, it was somewhat kind of agreed upon that this was going to happen. But Harry was also married to someone else. So I think it was very, very painful for Bill, uh, Christiana's husband, and Josephine, uh, Harry's wife. Uh, it was a very, very difficult, painful situation to be in. And in fact, um, so Christiana and and uh, Bill did have one child together who was known as Counsey, and that is uh, Hillary's father. And uh, before we we went live, you know, I was asking Hillary a little bit about that. She said, "Yeah, it was really, it was really difficult for my father." And um, and uh, you know, Christiana was uh, was 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 you know kind of again trying to leave this lead this very unconventional life but it had costs it did affect the people around her and that is the tension of individuation that that the the tremendous painful process of choosing the self which is different from choosing oneself mm-hmm. and there's a there's a famous quote from one of the gospels where Jesus says I've not come to make peace. Right. Which is that the self comes in this uncompromising way, which essentially puts us at odds with the prevailing mores, not always, but often. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of taking a little bit of a turn back to the vision seminars. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. Christiana Morgan did hundreds of paintings and drawings that Jung said he thought he was looking at Psyche. And he used her material as the basis for four years' worth of a special seminar. Uh, I forget how many volumes there are uh, called the Vision Seminars. And they were basically an extended case study of Christiana Morgan's uh, visions and and drawings and paintings uh, uh, that I you know I'm wondering if you can just add to that Joseph uh, because it was huge work. The, the difficulty in summarizing honestly is that Jung went into such tremendous specific detail that he really um, did not generalize at mm. all. That he took 
each of her visions and meticulously took apart the symbols where he found a mandala, for instance, was very interested for him. And Mm -hmm. he was very interested in the interplay between the masculine and the feminine, and particularly how it was different inside of the woman's psyche. For all of the criticisms we might lay at Jung's feet about Mm -hmm. misunderstanding the feminine psyche, he was the first one to say he didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was very clear that it would require female analysts to write about the mm-hmm. feminine psyche, that he, he really, it was clear to him that he just really couldn't do much with that. So the generosity of Christina to share so much of what was happening inside of her allowed him to get a sense of what individuation looked like in, and then of course he generalized it, but right. inside of the psyche of this woman And I think also what Hillary was trying to point to is in her ritualized experiments in the tower with her lover is that she Mm -hmm. was looking for that stage in the alchemical process where the masculine and the feminine merge. The Mm -hmm. anima, animus, and the ego merge so that something unprecedented, which is the birth of the incarnation of the self, then might happen. And she was, her work was was circling around this in a way that Jung found totally novel. Um, You know, I'm thinking about in volume five, um, uh, which is, what's, what's it called? I'm having a senior moment here. Um, volume five is... Um, Symbols of Transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it was originally called also like Psychology of the Unconscious or something. But yes, the volume five is super interesting, super important. And, and basically the meat of it is just him riffing off this woman's um, kind of fantasy material, the... the what was that woman's name? Miller, the Miller fantasies, right? right? Yeah, she had a she had like a man's name, but it's a woman. And it seems to me that um, something kind of, he does something sort of similar with the visions with Christiana's material and the visions of summoners. Although you know he didn't know Miller at all, um, he just had the fantasy material and he just kind of riffed off of it and pulled out all of these archetypal themes. So again, it was really like that projective test, like what is what is Young seeing? But, you know, what Douglas says in, in the biography of Christiana is that in the vision seminars, he was just kind of going beyond. He was just taking it places that didn't really feel relevant to her. He didn't do a good job of, um, of disguising her identity. And so she wrote him a, you know, she wrote him a, a letter or something really slapping his wrist and saying, you've got to stop. And apparently he did. And that's when he moved on to the Zarathustra lectures. Um, but, but, uh, you know, it's sort of like, so here's this material and one of the things, you know, it's sort of like, so what is the difference between masculine and feminine psychology and what does her life show us? And, you, you know, one of the things that I, I was really struck by in, uh, in reading the, the Douglas book is, is, you know, it's the hero's job to sort of overcome the dragon, but the, the heroine's job is to, is to, I don't know if befriend is the right word, but to come to terms with the dragon, which I thought was a, a, a really um, kind of remarkable uh, thing. And I thought, oh, I need to think about that more. But that something feels really right about that to me. What does that evoke for you when you say that? Well, I think that um, the, you know, the, the hero subdues the dragon and uh, kind of kills it and appropriates it, the energy of the dragon in that way, kind of incorporates it through dominion. But uh, a woman's psyche, it's more like has a relationship with that energy and can draw on it, but it never quite, you know... Um, she she's informed by it and she's in partnership with it rather than owning it. And what I would say is that the woman's uh, heroic journey is not one 
of victory, uh, dominion, mm -hmm. and, and right. basic opposition. It's one of incorporation. You know, there's some obvious echoes of biology here. Uh, men are, after all, built for thrusting. Mm -hmm. And uh, women are, um, can, are generative of the, the mystery of new life. And that in Christiana's artwork and drawings, paintings, you, you can see uh, Hecate and Lilith and witches and um, sky mothers and earth mothers and harpies, and the list goes on and on, that, that she incorporated and included in her sense of self. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's a really um, inward uh, process that I think we're really circling around here that that was imaged in her life. Mm -hmm. that her right. work was inner, in my you know, opinion, perhaps projection. Men uh, did uh, sort of uh, colonize that and take mm -hmm. some advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's some text here about one of her visions with a dragon, and uh, it's <laughs> a little bit too long to read. But um, uh, it, this is this is reading from Claire Douglas, just a kind of a summary of it. Christiana's vis vision showed her that a woman hero's task was not to kill the dragon, but to keep it alive, even as she separated herself from unconscious fusion with it and its power. So crucially, she did not make the dragon nice or socially acceptable, nor did she kiss it in the hope she would become a beautiful princess and live prettily and happily ever after with and for some man. She realized that a woman hero needed her dragon to stay a dragon. So it's, you know, that, that you know, uh, adds a whole new um, gloss on House of the Dragon, if anyone's watching that. Yep. You know, um, one of the thoughts that I've had for years is sort of like, what's the new myth? Well, of course, yeah. nobody can actually just sort of think up a myth. But I'm wondering it, uh, what Christiana Morgan's life, her art, the tower, the, the carvings, the stained glass windows, all of the stuff that she designed. I wonder where, what that intimates, suggests, mm -hmm. points to. In terms of of uh, a window into where the collective psyche may be going, right? The new, I thought it was interesting that Hillary used that term, the new religion, right? Because there's there's that Max yes. Zeller dream that we love to quote, where you know Zach, the the Deb, why don't you tell the Max oh, Zeller dream? Because I know you have it at your fingertips. I do because um, I really love this image. Max Zeller was an American analyst who went to see Jung shortly after World War II, when the world was, uh, perhaps as ever, a, a mess. And he was questioning, you know, how, how to help heal the world. And then he was going to leave, and then he woke up and he realized, oh my goodness, I forgot to tell Jung this dream that I had. So he called Jung, and Jung said, come on over, <laughs> which I've always thought was just a great response of, you know, never mind all the schedules in our calendars, just come on over. And Max Zeller's dream was that he saw people uh, across a vast sort of plain, all working on building, the, uh, creating the pillars of a great, vast temple. The foundation had been built, but as far as he could see, person after person was working on constructing the tower that would eventually uh, hold you know, the roof and then there would be walls. And Jung said, uh, yeah, you know, this is a dream that people all over the world are having that you don't know in Russia and China, everywhere, of that this is the new religion. This is the new temple. That's being built. That is being built. And that it would take hundreds of years in Jung's view to be completed. But it's a beautiful image of both the, the unity of one temple, and yet each person was constructing his or her own pillar. So the, the individual spirit and vision as part of uh, a communal 
and collective enterprise. And in uh, Jung's letters about about religion and particularly his arguments with uh, was it Father uh, White? Right. Yeah. Uh, about the future of Christianity, Jung was re- was predicting and felt that, and in fact, we are seeing this um, in our time. This rejection of inherited ideas, inherited theologies, inherited rituals, and that the turning within, the seeking the images, the seeking of the dreams that inform what we experience as spiritual, what we experience as the inner side of life, and finding our own language to describe and share that without it having to be contained in some kind of a collective declaration. That that is the future, and that Jung also felt that the images of Christ and perhaps new images that were emerging were also still relevant, but only relevant to the degree that they were personally discovered, that they were a living reality that a person could meet in their imaginal world and be changed by. So basically what he was saying is his theories of individuation were a way of him trying to track the natural emergent process of coming into relationship with God, which he called the self. That's great, yeah. You know, um, what I'm thinking about now is that I'd like to think of Christiana Morgan's tower, Jung's tower, and Marie-Louise von Franz's tower as three incredible pillars mm, um, yeah. in, a new, in a new mythic construct. And, uh, you know, of course, it doesn't have to be literalized architecturally. Oh, what I want it to be. <laughs> I think about your new place or your offices is not quite a tower, no, but it's got I, I, a little that's, of that that's vibe. What, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, yes, it does. Um, so I just want to give an update. We've been texting with our producer who has been trying to raise Hillary. And here is what I suppose is um, Joseph is uh, in North Carolina and said at the start, the thunder and lightning is crashing around. My internet's going in and out. He texted us, be ready to roll if I drop out. And I'm wondering if uh, Hillary's service just got knocked out. I don't know where she was calling in from, but apparently there's some big storm rolling around, at least maybe the mid-Atlantic, Joseph. And uh, it's and, bright and, and sunny Cape, and hot. Oh, really? It's sunny Cape and hot in Philadelphia. It's but... pouring rain here. Oh, we, okay. We lost our internet for a week. I lost it this morning. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd like to think of this as, uh, you know, having a kind of symbolic uh, aspect to it of uh, that mm-hmm. here we yeah. are. <laughs> yes. uh, here, he, the Christiana mm-hmm. Morgan had a stormy life mm-hmm. in a generative sense. Mm-hmm. Um, not it's not just destructive, but the the sky gods are weighing in. Yep. yep. Uh, as they we are. as we engage everyone on on her tower and her work and her incredible individuation process that she lived and mm-hmm. was faithful to uh, her entire life. Yeah, And that's really it, that she was faithful yeah. to her inner world. Right. And they mm-hmm. were disappointments. She wasn't credited appropriately, and she was disappointed yeah. by her lover. But she remained faithful to the image maker to the dream maker, to the center of her personality, which would <laughs> never abandon her or betray her, as it is for all of us. Right, right. And um, one of the, the things that really struck me is she, she had this incredible analysis with Jung that was so meaningful and so productive. Yes. And then he, you know, I think she felt pretty off-put by his rejection and his denigration. And yet she did not abandon the, um, she didn't, she didn't let that separate her from her task of being uh, faithful to uh, her own inner life. 
You know, she didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. She was like, well, you know, I, I don't know which sense she made of it, but she came home from Zurich, I think, somewhat trying to figure out what happened. But it didn't stop her from pursuing her own inner life and holding to these yeah. images faithfully and wanting to live out her own pattern. It's really a heroic uh, journey mm. uh, uh, and such a great story about the individuation process. In, in the face of all kinds of uh, cultural opposition, of uh, this isn't how women were supposed to quote be. Um, a lady, she was a an upper class Bostonian uh, uh, who could have led a, a very proper uh, life with of of social prominence. Uh, but she, she she did all kinds of things that went against cultural norms, uh, sort of moral norms. Uh, she had this. 40 year long relationship with a man who was not her husband. Uh, she, she kept on with her own uh, professional work with uh, Harry Murray at Harvard and her work in the Tower and stayed faithful to everyone in her life. She, she might be confrontive uh, and insistent on her own path. But she did not push anyone away. She did not say, that's mm -hmm. it. You know, basically, I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. So she was not rebelling, and she did not have to cut off any of these important relationships. Mm -hmm. It's an, a, a really astonishing journey uh, of what a life in pursuit of one's own individuation can look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we're all inspired by Christiana. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised I hadn't been closer to her material um, during training, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. it's like oh, this whole other good treat. Point. You yes. know, it was, re it was discovered yeah. uh, mm -hmm. later on. And uh, it's wonderful to have an unfolding understanding of more and more. Well, and, and what's exciting is there's there's more papers coming forward. I think my understanding is that the Jung family has some of the letters yes. between Christiana and Jung, and they're, you know, at some some point in the future they'll come forward. It sounds like um as as we heard, the you know, her vision books are hopefully going to be published. So it's a it's an interesting chapter, I think, also because um it's part of how Jung came to America. And there are, or, or to, you know, to the new world, let's say to the States, there are, there are, there are many, uh, parts to that story. Uh, and this is just one part, but it's an important one. Very important. And that we see the shadow, uh, in so many aspects of all of this, that none of these people were perfect. No. And that is not required, <laughs> nor no. is it possible. It's, it's interesting because the, you know, Jung looks like such a jerk. I'm going to use that clean <laughs> word um, when in this, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really interesting because Jung, yeah, Jung <laughs> is just kind of like a footnote. He's not, you know, he's not really a major player in the book, which is fitting, I think. And he just, he looks like a jerk. And, and that's, uh, you know, that, that, that there's an aspect, you know, he says that I was thinking about this. He says at the end of MDR, you know, my daimon required that I do this and I hurt he's something like, um, I, I know I've disappointed or hurt many people, you know, so he, he kind of fesses up to that at the end yeah. of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is this autobiography. And I was reading the 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 uh, Christiana mm -hmm. Morgan biography and I was thinking, oh yeah, there it is. You know, your your his daimon whipped him around and Yeah. And I wonder if Christiana felt that remorse towards what she put her husband through and her children. Right. Yeah, yeah. That that this um, ferocious dedication to one's own psyche and the suffering that that causes in other people. Again, there's always this temptation to characterize, um, to venerate one person and demonize mm -hmm. the other. But Christiana 
didn't seem to have any problem creating great pain for the people around her as well. Right. I totally, totally. Yeah. And I, 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 I mean, I, yeah. I think that's it's, part of what is so inspiring about all these lives that were intertwined with Christiana's or Jung's or anyone's uh, is that they were not perfect people. They really did have shadows. And so do we all. Yeah. But, and that need not stop us from living fully, honestly, consciously, uh, rather than trying to be, quote, good, unquote, mm-hmm. but to be real and to grasp the trajectory of our own lives uh, as fully as we can. And the courage to be disliked. Oh. By, you know, <laughs> yeah. In, in service to making mistakes, to learning, to throwing convention aside. Um, Jung said yeah. what he thought or felt was correct, what was rising inside of him, and it was up to Christiana to toss it away or make use of it. But the fact that she went home and she built a tower mm-hmm. based on her experience of Jung was also a way for taking something for her own. Uh, I'm looking at a few other questions. Is the tower still owned by the school, someone uh, shares? Yeah. Yes, it is. And now that Hillary has become involved and is collaborating with the school, that she's trying to change the way in which they perceive the tower and its value, but also helping the school find the funds. As we know, schools are not always, you know, dripping in money. So helping the school find the funds and the resources in order to renovate it and bring it back to the level that um, Christiana would have hoped for. And and we'll have links to this in, in the in the show notes when we eventually publish those. But yeah, there are there are efforts to to help the school and um and and also there's a another um, question just in our our last couple minutes. Someone says, you know, why why Jung's change of heart toward her? And although I don't think we'll know, maybe perhaps ever. Uh, but um, one of the suppositions is she went off to Munich and consummated her affair with uh, Harry Murray, and the, you know, sort of as as young, I think, had kind of encouraged her to do, is my understanding. And then when when she came back, you know, one of the thoughts is, well, he was jealous, you know, um, or or that he found the visions, the vision material was um, uncanny and unsettling. I mean, I you know, there is some stuff in the vision seminars where it's like, this is so uh, archaic that this, this is something that can't even be approached. So there was, there was something that was challenging. And I would also like to say again, she came, she left, she started an extramarital affair and Jung redirected her back to her own marriage, which is something that the biographer totally misses. Says, would, would you like to be a part of your family again? Would you, you consider having another child, that Jung was also trying to link her back into her husband and her children, perhaps wrongly so, but he was trying to restabilize something. Now, at what point does the analyst align with every choice that the ego makes of the analysand? Mm -hmm. But the idea that that was jealous, I think, by the biographer is a bit mean-spirited because it doesn't offer a broader frame of what Christiana was choosing to do in her life and the disruption that that was likely to cause her. Mm -hmm. So I I take exception with this nefarious um, assumption that way, because it's easy to have multiple perspectives. And yes, Jung may have said something that he regrets in the end. but. I I really want to cast off this idea of Christiana Morgan as being victimized. There were things that should not have happened that were disrespectful to her. But she also took these experiences and crafted an extraordinary life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have a yeah. glimpse of it. We have a yeah. glimpse of it. Yep. Uh, in in her papers and drawings, and especially 
in the tower, which, which is glorious. Mm-hmm. It's poignant, it's beautiful, it's unique, it, and there it is. That's her biggest and most bold statement about who she was. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that you can visit it now. Ah, oh, we have you back. Hello. I am so sorry. Completely lost <laughs> internet connection. I oh, my sorry, goodness. Guys. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good to talk to you about it. Amazing. Well, we were having we were having fun wildly speculating <laughs> about Christiana Morgan. You know, I'm glad. We were gone. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's yeah. okay. The gods have is, their way. This is part of what happens living in a rural area. Ah, just mm-hmm. it just sometimes drops out. So, so we're supposed to be winding down now, <laughs> but since we have you back, okay, shall we let? Let let uh, maybe maybe get take a couple more questions from the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna um, pick something and uh, here's one. Uh, it's noted that Christiana's journey with Jung began at the time of her Saturn return. Mm. Curious if that was ever noted by her or Jung. Did that have any significance to either of them, or do you have any thoughts about that? I haven't read anything in her notes about that. Um, so yeah, I don't, and I am looking into her astrology. I have had a reading done of her astrology, Mm -hmm. which has been very interesting. So, um, any insights from that you want to share with us? Um, I haven't, I haven't really uh, put it all together yet. It's okay. So yeah, maybe another time and certainly probably something be in the film. Great. Yeah. Um, someone else was asking if you'd be able to speak about your father's relationship with your grandmother. And she wants to also thank you for such a wonderful documentary. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, well, Christiana um, experienced very severe postpartum depression after she gave birth to my father. Mm-hmm. Uh, she became pregnant uh, a year after she married my grandfather who came back very, very damaged from World War I, um, really a shell of a man. Um, And she didn't want to be pregnant. Uh, She really, you know, as I said, had no very little maternal instinct. Um, So my father was, for the most part during his life, shuttled off to his grandmother's house, her mother's house, um, or her sister's house. Um, He spent a lot of time with his cousins growing up. Um, and then went off to schools. Um, so um, I think it was a very troubled relationship. Um, his father died when he was 13 um, mm. and spent his last few years um, because he had tuberculosis that he had contracted in the trenches of World War I, uh, was uh, recommended by doctors to go down to the warmer climates of the Southwest, which um, as an anthropology major, he then uh, lived amongst the Navajos and studied their dreams and published some work around that, which has um, been quite oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think though later when um, my father married and um, there was a, there was a little bit more reconciliation, I think he uh, Christiana really loved uh, my mother a lot, and so they spent some some years together that they grew to be quite close. But mm-hmm. I think you know a lot of the damage had been done, and I think that the the later years when her drinking was getting really bad, um, a lot of her sisters and other sort of extended family members that she had, you know, in some ways um, ignored or prioritized, um, not prioritized because of her work. Um, she was unable to sort of reestablish those relationships. Um, but I have wonderful interviews with my mother um, that mm. I did before she died um, about her relationship with my grandmother. And just, um, you know, they were quite close. And she talked about just how she was just a, a riveting um, conversationalist. She was so dynamic um, and witty and funny and engaging. And she was always reading uh, multiple books at once and 
you know, had such a creative mind. It was putting theories together and loved to talk about it and share it with people. And um, so it was, it was, um, she was a fascinating woman. When I think about Jung's idea of the evolution of the animus in a woman's psyche, the idea that the highest version of the animus is the logos, that there is kind of the word of the self comes into a woman's psyche and imbues her words and ideas with a kind of numinous power. Mm. And it sounds like the concept of that may have come from Christiana's images also. Mm. Mm-hmm. But it seems like she she was achieving that at times and had mm-hmm. that impact, and that ideas become the place of the divine. Mm-hmm. 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 But Hillary, how do you understand uh, your grandmother's later years, uh, relationships with with Harry? Um, there was drinking, uh, her death, her death. Yeah, someone was asking about the, mm-hmm. the nature of her death. What do we know about it? Um, yeah. Well, did, I described kind of a little bit about the the death in the Virgin Islands, right? So You touched on um, it briefly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's one of the great mysteries. There, there are so many different canyons of inquiry and mysteries that I've come across mm. in the story, which has just kept it infinitely fascinating. Um, but I know that um, she did drown in water. Um, you know, I, as a child, um, saw her swim every single day in the river outside the tower. We were always told as children never to swim alone, but she was out there swimming by herself. So uh, she was an expert swimmer. Um, but she um, did have a lot of problems with alcohol, was drinking heavily. Um, and she, um, according to Harry, left the ring that he had given her in a bag on the beach by the water before she yeah. entered it. And that she also left a passage um, to be read over her graveside at her bedside table. Um, and um, this is according to Harry, of course. Um, but I know, according to my family members um, and some of his colleagues, that uh, Harry, when he came back, gave everyone sort of a different story as to what happened down there uh, with her death. Um, so I, th- I think it's you know it's it's a it's a mystery in many ways that w- that we'll never know. Mm-hmm. Um, most recently, I had cousins um, who were at the time living in. Uh, Puerto Rico, who told me that Christiana and Harry came to visit them on their way to St. John's Island, mm. and they had never seen them happier. Oh. Um, and it's also well known that Harry was just beginning his two-year, uh, well, he was beginning a relationship with a woman who he then married two years later. So there was just a lot going on. Jeez. Um, Yes. And and hard to you know parse it all together you know mm-hmm. what what really happened, mm-hmm. um, so. Hillary, someone asked, "Can you visit the tower? Is it is is it a, you know available to the public to visit in some form?" Well, one of the things we're hoping to do. So, um, I would say, not really, because there are people living there now. Uh, there are teachers from the school that are their residents. Um, I occasionally have been leading tours, but the residents are due to leave next uh, spring. Uh, they will be vacating, and we will beginning. We will be doing a lot more of the renovation then. And I'm hoping to have it open so that I can lead tours and bring people that are interested mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to see it. It'll it'll be the first this Jungian life travel venture. Absolutely, that, yeah, great. <laughs> I'll yes, go absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Um, but one of our real hopes with the restoration of the tower, um, my grandmother asked for it to be an artist in residency and a scholar in residency. So uh, we would like it to be such that artists and, and uh, scholars come and do, are able to do their work there and also teach at the school. Um, and I, then I, during the summer, yes, yes, absolutely. 
And then during the summer, open it up to the wider public in order for, say, union groups to come and do workshops and seminars. Um, and there's a wonderful retreat center right nearby to house people. Wow. So we're really hoping that we can. Okay, we're there. We'll do it. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's really, really fantastic. Yeah. I, I love that uh, we're over time, according to the clock, you're back, and that this has been, <laughs> this has been put out into the world. Yeah. Uh, this is a dream in the world. And people listening and those who will listen, um, I, I believe we've just really seeded a dream. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm just hoping to continue that other people are inspired by her work and her, and her, her legacy. Yeah. Hillary, so thank I'm, you for having me on. I would love to just take one second of silence and ask you to, all of us, but for you to just go inside for a moment. You know, and ask your grandmother, is there anything that she wishes that you had brought forward that perhaps we hadn't prompted? I think that she would want people to know that that the support that 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 her work she would like others to gain insight and inspiration so that they can continue their journeys. So I think I think she felt so lucky that she was able to do it and gain so much from it. Mm. And and that's why it became her life work and and I think she really really wanted other people, you know, becoming an analyst, she helped that and I think her artwork speaks of that. I think the tower speaks of that. I think the book they're writing speaks of that. She wants others to feel insight and inspiration. And, and hope to change their lives. Mm. So. Thank you. She has touched us, and she can touch many more. Oh, I'm glad. As, as your dream comes into being for an artist residence and a retreat. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you that joined us live today, thank you for uh, sticking with us through <laughs> our, our technological challenges and then our, our weather challenges. Um, and uh, this will be um, available on our YouTube platform and, uh, and also as a podcast episode. And uh, we'll have all the information about how you can learn more about uh Christiana Morgan and Hillary's projects, and you can maybe support them too. So great. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.